Welcome. Uh, brilliant to see so many people here um, this afternoon. I think you are going to get some fairly diverse thinking into our deliberations today. I certainly hope so, because that's the nature of the event here. And as you can see, we know that we are going to be looking at things about waste and the circular economy. Conscious as we have to be that the backdrop to this is still about a very live and big proposal in our midst, namely the proposal for Javelin Park, which is still very live and it is bound to form a lot of the contributions that we get this afternoon. What we hope is that people won't be completely fixed on that story and that we can have a wider set of reflections around different models of managing resources in the kind of economy that awaits us. And again, once you're going to hear from all of our speakers, and I've just been talking to them now, is very much a view that we need to look forward at least for another 20, 30 years, to get any sense at all about the degree to which we're making good decisions today. That's really the issue that we're going to be trying to tease out. I'm sure you are all very familiar with the Javelin Park proposal. You know where it is. If things continue down the path that they're on at the moment, the construction is due to start in July this year. There are a number of steps that still have to be gone through before then. But that is essentially the issue right now, and the facts are well understood. A lot of people still feel very unhappy about that. Uh, a very large number of people still feel very unhappy about that, and no doubt we'll hear some voices to that effect this afternoon. But our job for you to start with is to open up the wider context about what good planning, good models of development look like in this whole area of integrated resource management. And I'm still always, wherever I end up in life, trying to move people as much as possible away from the use of the word waste, because we do really have to get used to thinking much more about integrated resource management in which the word waste gradually diminishes away so that it falls out of our lexicon completely at some stage in the not too distant future. So I thought what I might usefully do is to suggest for you in my opening comments eight principles that it would be really helpful for decision makers to abide by were they seriously intent on making good decisions around resource management within a fully-fledged, integrated, sustainable development context. Because that's essentially the essence of what we ask of our decision makers now is not to make decisions without proper concern and attention to a longer period of time, during which, as we know, our economy must inevitably become more sustainable than it is today. Otherwise, it's a very difficult prospect for the future of humankind in general. So what are those eight principles? Firstly, good decision-making has to be transparent. It is extremely difficult to command the respect of citizens today, where the processes by which any decision is arrived at are obscured by commercial confidentiality or other reasons to keep things secret. And as you know, with this proposal, this has been vexatious from day one. We have not had access to the data that we should have had as people in this, in this part of the world. That has been impossible to get hold of. There is a freedom of information process now fully still in play. The information commissioner will be hearing that at the end of this month. But good decision-making requires transparency of that kind. And the lack of that in this particular development has been massively problematic. And I remember when we had an event three years ago, two, three years ago, that issue of transparency was a very big issue that people were intent on. And I have to say, this is one of the most egregiously untransparent processes I have come across in a very long time. Secondly, of course, because when we're talking about integrated sustainable development, we're thinking about environment, society, and the economy. So we have to be able to guarantee value for money for people over a period of time. And in this case, over the lifetime of the particular asset that we are talking about here, or alternative assets. 
that could be brought forward as a different model to what we're getting with this mass burn incinerator. You'll hear from Tom and from others in the talks that they're going to give that you might want to question whether or not we've actually got value for money in the proposal here, but it'll be up for you to judge that. Thirdly, coming back to sustainable development, it requires a very strong level of community engagement. One of the things we've learned, often quite painfully, over the last 20, 30 years, is that to make long-term projects of this kind work, it is really important to have the community engaged at every step along the way. That has not been possible with this project, and you're going to hear a lot more about that from uh, examples elsewhere, particularly in Oxfordshire. Fourthly, just as we need efficiency in terms of the use of financial assets, so we need efficiency in terms of material assets, efficiency in resource use. Now, for me, one of the things that always bugged me most about the Javelin Park proposal, right from day one, thinking of it thermodynamically, was that there is no intention to use the heat that will be generated in the process of producing the electricity. Honestly, today, this is almost insane. It just beggars belief that a combination of responsible, local, elected representatives of this community and representatives of apparently responsible private sector company can so irresponsibly refuse to allow a more efficient process of that kind to move forward. I, that is one of the things that still completely bugs me. So you may want to return to that, and I hope that Mike from Unomia will have us, give us a little bit of a glimpse into that whole notion of waste to energy, energy from waste plants and what that looks like thermodynamically from that point of view. If I've got the figure right, this plant will operate at a total thermal efficiency of around, total efficiency of around 22%. I don't think you should really ever get planning permission for something like that, but anyway. Fifth, and this is important, and this is getting more into the complicated stuff around sustainable decision-making and infrastructure management. These days, it becomes increasingly important to avoid what planners describe as infrastructure lock-in, a series of decisions which, once taken, cannot then be undone. However, unhelpful those decisions might be at some point in the future. This decision obviously has a very high element of infrastructure and financial lock-in to it, and it will essentially dictate part of the way in which resources are managed in this part of the world for 25, at least 25 years, and probably longer. <sighs> Energy from waste plants are clunky plants today, okay? Even now, this is a clunky technology. This is not smart technology. One can legitimately describe it as really quite basic technology, possibly even stupid technology. Because what we know is that the speed of technology change in this whole area is going to be dramatic. We will see incredible changes around the technology brought forward to help manage resources more efficiently than we do so today. And as I was thinking about this today, I couldn't help but think of uh, a comparison in my mind between this plant and Hinkley Point. Now, I know you may find that a ridiculous comparison, but nonetheless, I'm looking at this uh, absurd decision to build two new nuclear power stations at Hinkley Point using a technology that is already completely redundant in many respects and leaving a legacy for much, much longer than this proposal will leave one, but it's very similar. Moving on, sixth principle is we need our decisions in this whole area of resource management to take us towards what is called the circular economy, and you're going to hear a lot more about that today, and move us away from very simplistic, very crude, linear routes to creating economic value. At the moment, much of our economy is based on this extremely linear process where you take raw materials from the earth or from our economy, you fashion them into the products that we need in society, and once you've done that, they're disposed of and they go into a waste stream. There is a huge surge of interest now around this notion of 
the circular economy. It's been very live for the last four years. It's a big thing in the EU. It's going to become a critical part of fashioning genuinely sustainable economic models for the future. Seventh, we need all these decisions to be future-proof. We need them to allow for the kind of changes that are going to happen at some point in the future. That means they have to be proof against the inevitability of changes, some of the changes that will happen through the EU. I'm making an assumption here, as you can tell, that on June the 23rd, people will be as sensible as we need them to be and will not give in to insane Brexit fantasies. But through the EU, we know that we will see higher targets for recycling and resource use. We have to make decisions that are proof against changes of that kind. What is the point of making big decisions that cannot possibly factor in the inevitability of that process? And then lastly, and then I'm done in my role as relatively neutral chair for, this, for today's um, <laughs> um, <laughs> deliberations. <laughs> um, we have to make decisions today that take us towards an ultra-low carbon economy. An ultra low carbon economy. I'm finding a lot these days that people haven't really caught up with the implications of the Paris Agreement. The agreement that was signed back in Paris in December was then formally signed on Friday last week, a week ago in New York, by 60 of the world's countries that signed up and will hopefully be ratified over the course of the next year by all, all of those countries. People haven't really got their heads around the true import of the Paris Agreement which has asked governments now to accept that our current thresholds for what we hoped would be a stable climate, namely no more than a two degrees centigrade average temperature increase by the end of this century, is not good enough. The scientists are saying that will not give us a high enough probability of a stable climate. So the science now tells us we're going to have to think about a stable climate within a temperature threshold of no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade average temperature increase by the end of this century. That may not sound like much, 2 degrees centigrade. Coming down to 1.5 degrees centigrade, it is an absolutely gobsmackingly massive change in the speed with which we're going to have to introduce new processes, new technologies, new ways of creating wealth. It is an imperative that we cannot ignore. And to bring forward very carbon-intensive technological routes to managing our challenges today, resources and so on, just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because we will be on a very dramatic decarbonization trajectory from this point on. So if you think about this plant, if you think about Javelin Park, with a lifespan, an asset lifetime of 25, maybe 30 years, no doubt those who will be investing in it think that it'll still be doing something useful for us in the year 2050. I just want to remind you all that world leaders now are all signed up to something called the Zero net carbon economy by 2050. So what are we going to do when we bring forward new assets which demonstrably are not heading towards net zero emissions, which will still be in our midst in 10, 20, 30 years time? This is the height of irresponsibility, is actually imposing upon people a carbon legacy which will cost us dear to deal with for a very long time. So we cannot put that to one side. We don't know what the emissions will be from Javelin Park, whether it's 26,000 tons per annum, whatever it might be, but it's a significant volume of additional greenhouse gas emissions. So those are sort of eight principles, just to think about ways in which good decision-making should happen in this space. And without that, we are entitled to question our politicians and indeed our wealth creators, many of whom by the way, have moved into a very different place than uh, might be the case in this instance, and ask them to do a better job than is currently being done. Anyway, okay, so we have three sort of um, perspectives on this this afternoon. 
um, which will help us to bottom out the degree to which some of the decision making around this issue is taking us in that direction, social, economic, environmental, transparency, governance issues. To what extent are we moving towards that? Mike Brown, Managing Director at a consultancy called Unomia, will start us off looking at this whole question about energy from waste and the broader context around EFW plants here in the UK. He'll be followed by Simon, Simon Kenton, who will be talking from his perspective from resource futures, looking in particular at some of the other things going on here in the UK, um, particularly in Oxfordshire. Tom Jarman will come after him as co-founder of the community R4C, something I'm sure you've all been following. He will present that as an alternative model, a different way of looking at what we could do with our resources here in this part of the UK. And then on the panel afterwards, we'll be joined by uh, Charles Newman um, from the editor of uh, Resource Magazine. So, that's the fair that is laid before you. Enjoy it. Enjoy it.